Welcome to video one for week 11. Here, like in single variable calculus, now that we've gone through the work of defining a derivative, we want to use that derivative to solve certain types of problems. One of the first things we did in single variable calculus was to use it to solve optimization problems. And we're going to do the same thing here. We want to talk about extrema of scalar fields, when these functions have their maximum and their minima. So let me take a scalar field. Let me give you the formal definition of what a local maximum and a local minimum is for these scalar fields that depend on multiple inputs. So a point p in the domain, so a point p in the domain, is a local maximum if there's some small number epsilon that's going to be the local part of the local maximum, such that the function value is larger than all nearby values. The way I say nearby values is to use this notation. This b p epsilon is notation for the ball centered at p with radius epsilon, which is all nearby points, all points that are within the distance epsilon of the center point p. In Rn, I have multiple directions to approach a point. We saw this with limits. Same thing here for local max and local min. A local maximum has to be a maximum in all directions of movement from the point. So from this point p, I can move out in all sorts of directions. And no matter what direction I go, I need to get uh, values that are lesser than or equal to my maximum, if this is indeed a maximum. Same thing for local minimum. Uh, exactly the same definition, but I reverse the inequality. Likewise, in all directions it has to be a minimum, so if this is a local minimum, then all directions of movement have to give me values which are larger or equal to the minimum. Now, the situation gets a little more complicated in multiple dimensions because we have other types of extrema as well. And the only one I'm really going to work on in this course is the idea of a saddle point. So a point in R2, I'll illustrate it in two dimensions, so it has higher dimensional analogs is a saddle point. If there are two different directions, and these are local directions from a point, so I think about a point here as a local direction u and a local direction v, and in the direction u, if I move a little bit in the direction u, um, so for some delta less than some number epsilon, epsilon being a local area, so if I move in a little direction u, either positive or negative, then I get something larger. So I have one axis around my point where things are going up in both directions, u and negative u. But I have another direction, v and negative v, uh, that if I move a little bit in that direction, things are going down. So I have a second axis where things are going down. This gives me a saddle point. It's a minimum in one direction and a maximum in the other direction. Called a saddle point because it sort of looks like that saddle type shape. I tend to think of it more as a pass because I like to think of mountain landscapes when I think of scalar fields. So a pass is a place where if this is the pass, then I've got a valley over here and a valley over here, and I climb up to the pass and climb back down to the other side. And it's the low point um, that I between the, the ridge here that I'm crossing. So this goes up here, this goes up here. It's the lowest point there, but I still have to get up to it, and it's the highest point on my path from one valley to another. So that, that's how I think of the definition of a saddle point as a, as a pass for walking through the mountains. But it's a good indication that extrema can be quite different in multivariable situations. It's not just the situation of a maximum and a minimum. So how do we find them? Well, if we have a single variable function, extrema are indicated by the fact that the derivative is equal to zero. But our derivative is now a new thing. For multivariable functions, the extrema are indicated by all derivatives equal to zero, all partials. And the best way to succinctly say that is to say that the gradient is zero. This, of course, is the zero vector, the gradient is a vector. So we'll find extrema when the gradient is a zero vector. Notice all of the partials have to vanish, not just one. It's not good enough to just have one of the partials be zero. All of the partial derivatives have to be zero to give ourselves an extrema. I want to do two examples to indicate some of the different ways in which this works and some of the situations that can come up. Uh, here's a relatively simple scalar field. I take its partial derivatives. Partial derivative of an x is constant 1. Partial derivative of y is negative 2y. This gradient can never be 0 because the x partial is constant 1. So this thing has no extrema. What does this thing look like? Well, it's sort of this ridge going up here and down here. And I can go over this ridge in some kind of path, but at no point on that ridge is it a maximum or a minimum. It's not even a saddle point. 
because I have these directions that go up and down, I have these directions that go up and down. There's no one direction where it's a minimum or one direction where it's a maximum. So this is an example of a function which has no maxima or minima, and what's indicated by the fact that the gradient never vanishes. Here's another scalar field, the cosine of x plus y. Take the partial uh, with the chain rule, I get negative sine x plus y, derivative of the inside is one, so that doesn't have any effect. Uh, this is equal to zero whenever sine of x plus y vanishes. Well, that happens when x plus y is any multiple of pi. If I solve for y, I get this, and this is a series of lines in R2. They all have the same slope negative one, but they have different multiples of pi as their intercept. So this is going to give me a series of parallel lines in R2 of slope negative one. And I'm going to get extrema along all of those parallel lines. What do those look like? Well, here's a graph of that function. Here are those parallel lines. Some of them are maxima, some of them are minima, but I get them all along this function. And at every point along one of these lines, each of these infinitely many points is a maximum point. The definition of maximum minima include lesser than equal precisely for these kind of cases. Because this is flat in this direction, but a maximum otherwise, we do call this a local maximum. Because it is flat in this direction, but a minimum otherwise, we do call those things at the bottom of that valley local minimum. So we have whole lines of extrema here, and that's a thing that can happen. We can have infinitely many extrema, and they don't even need to be separated. They can be attached together in lines, all of the points on the line being a local min and a, or a local max.